uh, there's, there's a story of an elderly, elderly uh, man that he took his wife to the fair one year, and he really wanted to take a helicopter ride. However, the cost was $50, and that was a bit expensive for this family, and so he tried his best to reason with her, and he said, you know, honey, I, it's a helicopter ride, and, and I know it's a, it seems like a lot, but, you know, it's, it's only $50. We get it for what we get. And his wife replied, you know, 50 bucks is 50 bucks, no deal. As they're arguing, the helicopter pilot overheard the couple's conversation, and he said, listen, I'll make a deal with both of you. I'll take both of you for a ride, and if you can both stay quiet for the entire length of the ride and not say one word, I won't charge you a dime. But if you speak one word, you owe me 50 bucks. The couple agreed, we think we can do that, and so they go up in the helicopter. While in the air, the pilot performed all kinds of fancy moves and tricks, but not a word was said by either the husband or the wife. The pilot did his death-defying tricks over and over again, but still there wasn't one word spoken. When they finally landed, the pilot turned and said, Wow, I've got to hand it to you. I did everything I could to get you to scream or shout, but you didn't say a word. I'm really impressed. The man said, "Uh, Well, to be honest with you, I almost said something when my wife fell out, but you know, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Praise the Lord. My wife wanted me to tell that today. She thought it was such a great joke. <laughs> if you're visiting today, my joke is usually the highlight of the, of the message, and it's pretty much downhill from there. So I just, I just want to forewarn you. Uh, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 21. Ephesians 4 and 21. Uh, Week one, we're in week three of this series that we're calling adulting. Week one, we're in the first chapter of Ephesians. Week two, uh, we were in the second chapter. Now we're going to jump ahead to the fourth chapter of Ephesians. You know, with that being said, I've had some people ask me, you know, um, Pastor, when you go through a book of the Bible, why don't you go through the book of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse by verse on Sunday mornings? And, And there's a reason that I don't use that approach. Some pastors do that, and that's okay. You'll never go wrong preaching the Word of God, but I don't feel like it's the best approach on a Sunday morning to, uh, for, the, for the overall health and balance of the church. For instance, Paul says this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26. He's actually speaking to the elders at the church of Ephesus when he says this, the, the book that we're in. He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shriek from declaring, shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul preached the whole counsel of God. So spending six months to a year or more in one book makes it much more difficult to preach the whole counsel of God over the entire course of a year. It's much easier as a pastor to do that because I know exactly what I'm teaching on next week. Oh, we're on verse 3. Praise the Lord. That's, it's, so it's easy. You don't have to dig and, and really, really search. Um, but that type of teaching is more suited for a weekly Bible study, a small group, something like that. Instead, you'll notice that I'll do, a te- I'll do a series out of the New Testament like we are now, do a series out of the Old Testament, and then possibly a series out of the Gospels, and then a topical series, so forth. And I try to follow that format and I've, because I've found that this approach does its good balance for the Word of God over the course of a year. When we do go over through a book like we're doing now, rather than verse by verse, chapter by chapter, what I do is I try to pick key themes out of that book that I feel like God is wanting me to speak to the church on at that, at that point. For instance, if we were going chapter, chapter, verse by verse, Ephesians chapter 3 and, and into the first part of chapter 4 is about unity. And I hit unity, if you've been here for, the, for a very long time, you know this, I hit unity really hard over the last couple years because that's the truth we needed to hear as a church when everything was going nuts. And I felt like that truth sunk in. I feel like right now we are doing very well there. We are healthy there. So I didn't feel like God was asking me to address it Again, going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you're more likely to bring up subjects that are not relevant to the season the church is currently in. So there's not good balance. That's why I don't do that. 
Is doing studies like that important? Absolutely. You should absolutely do things like that um, as a believer. But as far as Sunday mornings are concerned, I don't feel it's the best approach to keep balance and preach the whole counsel of God. Next week, since it's child dedication weekend, got some babies being dedicated, some children next weekend, we're going to be going to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to be talking about parenting. Amen. Don't miss next week's message. I've told you the story of my mother before, and for those of you that know the, the, the story of my childhood, you know it was quite a mess. But despite that, I've, I've never told you this before, despite that, there was something that my mother did very well when I was growing up that I believe because she did it so well, it put me on the path that I am on today. And I'm going to share that with you next week. It's something that you don't really understand until you're adult and you look back over your life and you're like, ah, yeah, thank you, mother, for that. It's the same thing that we did raising our kids. And I'm calling the message next week the number one key to raising kids. Kids, it's a parenting principle found in the Word of God. Trust me, you want to be here for that. Then the following week, we're going to circle back to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to wrap up the series, and then it's Palm Sunday. It's our great egg hunt. That's going to be a big day. I'm believing hundreds of people are going to come to know the Lord that day. You, you don't, we need all hands on deck that day, so make sure that you're here for that. Okay, long introduction. Let's get started. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 21, here we go. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Now here we go, verse 23. This is what I want you to really uh, focus on. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy, So stop telling lies, let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body, and don't sin by letting your anger control you, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing, instead use your hands for good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Did you know that you can be a Christian? And that's Paul's addressing this here, Christians. And we can, we can bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit based on the way we live, the choices we make. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I'm calling this message this morning, Turn Around. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ to speak this truth from your word. Father, I just I ask, Father, that we would not leave this place the same as when we walked in, but we would leave this place changed because your words bear witness to our spirit and to our heart, God. I pray, Father, that you would remove the blinders from every spiritual eye and every spiritual ear so they can clearly hear and understand this truth from your word today. And I thank you for it. I thank you for the anointing to present it. In Jesus' name, amen. After Jesus was baptized, he was led into the desert uh, to be tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. After he comes out of the desert in this time of testing and trial, he began his public ministry. He began to preach and teach about the kingdom of God. When he began to preach, the first thing that he said can be found in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. Here is what he said. He said, from that time, Jesus began to preach from the time he came out of the desert. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of all the things he could have said in his opening sermon, he says to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the same message that John the Baptist preached. We see this earlier in the book of Matthew, chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message, the message 
of repentance. Now, for a lot of us, just the fact that I have mentioned repentance kind of makes you cringe because for many of us, especially if you've been in the church a while, when you hear the word repentance, you instantly think of something bad. I know for the longest time I did. And this is primarily because preachers for years have taught on the subject of repentance and they have used it to beat people over the head with the Bible saying things like, repent or you're going to hell. Turn or burn, they used to say. You've probably seen somebody holding a sign such as this. Repent or perish. If you've been to a bigger city, you've probably seen that a time or two. Now, I understand the thinking behind that message. I I totally understand it because repentance is where salvation starts. But that was not the message of Jesus when he started to preach. That's fear-based. Jesus did not say, repent or you're going to hell. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for this good thing is knocking at your door. So when you see a guy standing along the side of the road or wherever it might be holding a sign like that, he's actually holding a sign that contradicts the message of what Jesus is trying to relay to the unbeliever. Jesus did not stand on a corner and yell at unbelievers and tell them that they were going to hell. You never see that in the Gospels. But what did he do? Because... Because this message actually pushes people further away from God, and you've probably seen that over time. So instead of having that message of repent or you're going to hell and standing on the corner holding the sign, that was not Jesus' ministry. Instead, we see him serving the unbeliever. We see him loving the unbeliever. Do you know who he was harsh with? (laughs) The religious people. He shredded the religious people over and over again. So did John the Baptist. Same thing. John called them a brood of vipers in Matthew chapter 3. Now apparently that was pretty harsh talk back then, but you were a brood of viper. And it's because if you, if, you, if you follow the Gospels, you'll see that a lot of the religious people, they thought they were better than everybody else. And so they were hypocrites and Jesus addressed that. And we see the same thing, unfortunately, today. And the condemnation, and and so this condemnation message is what we shout as Christians from our rooftops. And we have to understand that that message is actually not drawing people to God. It's pushing people away from God. And we do it, and we think we're defending God, and we do it in the name of the, God, name of the Lord, but the message that we're portraying is actually a message of, uh, that's opposite of what Jesus was trying, to, was trying to teach. And then when people fight back, <laughs> we call it, Pastor, I'm being attacked by the enemy. Because we think in our minds that we're truly defending God. And so what we've learned to do as a Christian is we defend And we praise the Christian living the hypocritical life, but then we trample the unbeliever under our feet. And Jesus did just the opposite. Jesus ministered to the unbeliever, and he came after those that said they were believers because they should know better at that point. If you ask most Christians today to define the word repent, they're going to more than likely say it means a change of heart. And that is a result of repentance, but that's not what the word means. And I preached this myself wrong for years. I'm guilty of this as well. I'm speaking to myself here because like a lot of pastors, I preach this from the stance of condemnation. I've got messages I've written that I could go back and pull that I have spoke this from a, from, a, from a sense of condemnation. Repent or you're going to hell. And that's what I preached because that's what I was taught. Now, I'm going to lay a foundation here. We're going to circle back to and see what, how this ties into what Paul is telling us here in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. The word repent comes from the Greek word metatonio. I, I don't know if I said that right or not, but there it is on the screen. You can pronounce it yourself. And it means change of mind. So it means to change your mind. But I was always taught that repentance was a change of heart. Because ultimately, that's what needs to happen. If you want to see lasting change, you got to have something happen within this thing right here, your heart. 
In order for your life to be changed, your heart has to be transformed. But the more I've matured as a believer and the more I've come to understand the Word of God in its entirety, I have come to realize that I don't have the ability to change my heart. And neither do you. Only God has the power to change the human heart. We don't have the ability to do that. But what can we do? What do we have authority to change? We could change our mind. And when you change your mind, you allow God to come in and change your heart. God is not going to tell you to change something that you have no control to change. So what Jesus is saying is, change your mind because the kingdom of heaven is near. And when you truly change your mind, when you truly repent, now watch this, you will always see it followed by action. It starts here, but the proof is in our action. The fruit of true repentance is a changed life. John says this in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. Um, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Prove by the way you live, that's action, that you have turned to that repented of your sins and turned to God. The proof that we have repented or that we are now thinking differently is good fruit in our life. James says this in James chapter 1 and verse 22. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For example, you have a health scare. Maybe you have an issue with your heart. You go to the doctor. The doctor tells you that you're going to need to make some drastic life changes or there will be future complications. Now you could shake your head and agree with him as he speaks, but if you don't change your mind, you're going to go right back to doing what you were doing before. You heard the doctor, you hear the message, you understand what he is saying, you know the truth, but you don't do what he says. But on the other hand, if you're listening to him talk and something clicks in your mind, you will leave the hospital room determined to make the changes you need to make. A true change of mind, true repentance is always shown through actions. That's the fruit. Here's another example. Imagine a man has a drinking problem. This drinking problem is causing issues in his marriage, which unfortunately is not very uncommon here. The wife, because of this, threatens to leave him and he begs her to stay, saying he's going to change. Honey, I promise I'm going to change. We have counseled numerous couples where this has happened. He says he's going to quit drinking. And at that moment, it appears he has repented. It appears he has changed his mind. But the proof, if the repentance is real, will be shown through his actions. If he continues the same behavior, there was no true repentance. He was only responding in fear to get his wife to to stay. Paul solidifies this truth here in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at this again and let's start to break this down now. Let's look at verses 21, 22 again in Ephesians chapter 4. This is what he says. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Paul tells us, To throw off our sinful nature and let the Spirit renew our thoughts and our attitudes. In the original Greek, the words thoughts and attitudes are the same word. And they mean mind. So what is Paul telling us? He is telling us to renew or to change our mind. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person. Remember, only God can transform our heart. So he says, let God transform you into a new person. Now look at what he says, by changing the way you think. 
Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. He tells us not to copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Basically, don't think like that. Let God transform you by choosing to change the way you think. He's talking about repentance. Do you want to change your heart? Only God can do that, but it starts by changing the way you think. And as you start to think differently, you will start to become transformed into the person that God has created you to be. Now, some people will say, once you are saved, you never need to repent again. And it's because they don't understand what repentance means. That's like saying once you're saved, you never need to change your mind again. And unfortunately, some people don't. (laughs) We don't need to be saved again, but there's going to be times that we need to repent again. And it's because we need a mind shift. And some of us need to repent often. I'm going to prove it to you. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Now watch this. The Word of God is amazing. Here in Revelation, Jesus is speaking to John, and he tells John to write seven letters to seven different churches. We see these letters that he wrote in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. The first church he writes to is none other than the church of Ephesus, the same church that Paul is writing to when he tells them to change the way they think. Look at this message of Jesus to the church In Ephesus, this is what he says, chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel, angel means messenger, which in this case would have been the pastor. The pastor would have received this letter, and then he would have read this letter to the congregation. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So again, this letter is addressed to the believer in the church. It's addressed to the church. And this is what Jesus says. He said, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those that are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So he's saying you have done this very well. Verse 4, but I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from which you have fallen. Now watch. Repent. He's talking to the church. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he's writing to the church and the message to the church is to repent. Let me paint a word picture so you can understand where this church in Ephesus is currently at when this was written. A person comes to church, they get radically saved, they get on fire for the things of God. I see that a lot. They jump in with both feet, they start serving, the things of God are a priority. But then over time, and I've seen this a lot as well, unfortunately, the newness begins to wear off. They quit serving as much. They quit reading God's word and praying as much. The things of God slowly start to take a back seat in their life. They're saved, yes, but the things of God are not much of a priority as they used to be. This is an easy trap for all of us to fall into once we've been saved. I've fallen into this before as well, guilty. And this is where the people in this church of Ephesus overall, generally speaking, were at. Jesus tells them to repent or to change their mind and once again start doing the things they did at first. What is that? That is action. If they did not, he would remove their lampstand. In other words, he said, I'm going to remove your light. I'm going to remove your favor to the community. He, that's another message in itself. But just because we're saved doesn't mean we no longer need to repent. For instance, maybe you're in here today and your relationship with God isn't as strong as it used to be. Maybe you don't know the Word of God very well. So today, you change your mind and you decide, I'm going to leave that place and I'm going to do something different. Maybe in this case, you say, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes earlier every day 
I'm going to read the Word of God and I'm going to pray and I'm going to do it even if I don't feel like doing it. So what have you done? You've changed your mind. You have decided to do something different. Your life hasn't changed yet. You just simply made a choice. But here's what happens. Because of that choice and the fact that you're now making things of God, the things of God a priority, your heart begins to change. Some of you have allowed your heart to become hard. You've been saved for years, and you've allowed your heart to become hard. It was once on fire for the things of God. You would serve the needs of others. You would spend time with God. You would be faithful to the house of God. But over time, you step back, and you've allowed your mind to once again start thinking like the world. This, <laughs> this is what happened during the COVID mess over the past two years. Many of us, and I'm talking about good, solid Christian people, had allowed our minds to think like the world instead of thinking the way God thinks. And this caused a bunch of unnecessary problems. (laughs) I remember telling Kyla, I feel like a junior high principal most days. (laughs) Because people were fighting and fighting. And that's why I got up here and I constantly tried to change your mind to get your focus off of the things of the world and onto the things of God. Because I know that when we do that and we start to get our focus on the things of God, it gives God permission to move in and change our heart. And I watched that happen with several people. It didn't happen with everybody, unfortunately. But there were several For instance, I remember a man telling me that he was at home watching our governor, the governor of Wisconsin, speak. It was one of those addresses during that time when everything was going crazy. And he said, Pastor, I was angry when he spoke. He goes, I didn't like the guy. As a matter of fact, I'd probably say it's pretty close to hate. Now, he never met the governor. The governor never did anything to him personally. (laughs) Never showed up at his door and kicked his door in or anything like that. But he hated him simply based on his political party. He didn't didn't like him. So he said, he's telling me this. He said, I'm I'm sitting there and as he's speaking, I'm putting him down as he's talking. And I'm saying, I'm screaming things at the TV. And he said, as I was sitting there doing that, the Spirit of God convicted me. And in my mind, the scripture popped up, the scripture that I preached on, that tells us to pray for those in authority. He said, the next thing you know, I was praying for him, and he goes, it was like almost overnight, but he goes, I no longer carry the anger and hatred that I once carried. But do you see what happened? Originally, he thought like the world. The world told him to gripe and complain about your leaders, throw them under the bus, bash them on social media, but he had a shift in his thinking, and the shift in his thinking led him to prayer, which is what? action. He did what the Word of God told him to do. He aligned his thinking with the Word of God, and when he changed his thinking, when he repented, God changed his heart. God took away the anger, and he took away the hatred just like that. Do you see it? Are you seeing this? Is this making sense? I'm telling you this truth will change your life. Life. Some of you in here today, some of you watching online need to repent of some things in your life. For instance, some of you need to forgive someone that's hurt you. You need to repent of unforgiveness. Boy, this is tough. The world tells you hold a grudge. But I want to tell you today, if you change your mind and forgive, action, forgiveness, action, it allows God to work in your heart. And heal you. Unforgiveness is like eating rat poison and expecting the other person to get sick. Unforgiveness does not hurt the other person. It only hurts you. And that's why we are told to forgive. That's why God tells us to forgive those that have hurt us. Because God wants you to experience freedom. And the only way you're going to experience freedom is if you change the way you think and forgive. Freedom comes through repentance. You see, repentance is a good thing. And that's why Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven 
is at hand. This is a good thing. It'll change your life. It'll set you free. Back to Ephesians. After Paul tells us to change the way we think, he goes on to give some very practical examples of what this looks like. Verse 25. Very simple. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Basically, change the way you think. The world tells you to lie. Don't think like the world. Align your thinking with the Word of God and tell the truth. Following through is action. Verse 26. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Again, change the way you think. Not letting the sun go down on her anger is telling us don't stew on it. Don't stew on it. Many of us think, I just I can't go to bed until I'm not angry anymore. No, don't stew on it. If someone offends us and we think about it and we think about it some more and we think about it some more, what happens? We get angrier and we get angrier and we get angrier until we finally act on it and we do something we later regret, regret now, as Paul says, giving the devil a foothold. Verse 28, if you're a thief, quit stealing. That's pretty simple. <laughs> Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. You see, these are life decisions. We decide, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to be a thief anymore. I'm not going to steal toilet paper out of the church bathroom anymore. Amen. Somebody needed to hear that. The things you say under the anointing, I tell you what. <laughs> oh, it's fun. But we repent and we decide, I'm not going to do that anymore. Verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. That's, an, that's a sermon right there. We do a whole sermon on the power of our words. We've done it before. Same thing. It's a decision that says, I'm not going to act like that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's, re, it's repentance. Verse 30, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live, by your actions. Remember, he has identified you as his own. Remember, Paul's speaking to the believer here. Guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So get rid of it. Bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, change the way you think. Be kind to each other. These are actions. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Ultimately, true repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. And it's a lifelong process for the believer. For the unbeliever, it's required for salvation. Salvation is where your life of repentance starts. Salvation is where a changed life starts. The book of Acts is a wonderful book as it focuses specifically on repentance in regards to salvation. Acts is a story of how the church got started, and so naturally many people were being saved. To repent, now watch this, in relation to salvation, is to change your mind regarding sin and Jesus Christ. In Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he concludes his sermon by, with the call for people to repent. Repent from what? Change their minds about what? He was telling them to change their minds about who Jesus was. And that's the first step. That's what we all must do. Jesus was Messiah and Savior, but they didn't believe that. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We change our mind and we now believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead. We change our mind. That's the first part. The action behind that is confessing with your mouth out loud, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me. So it's a two-step process. 
Repentance is how you get into the kingdom of God. Repentance is where your new life in Christ starts. But I hope you see now it's not a one-time event. It's an ongoing lifestyle. And as we continue to change our minds and our actions to line up with the word of God, we then allow God to come in and change our heart. And that's where we see the lasting change. I'm going to invite Sam to come, come back up at this time. In 2010, I'm going to close with this. Sandra Bullock won the Best uh, Actress Academy Award for her performance in the movie The Blind Side. You've probably maybe seen that. Great movie. It's a story of a Christian family who took in a, a young homeless man, and they gave him the chance to reach his God-given potential. The young man's name was Michael Orr. Raised in the inner city, Michael became the first round NFL draft pick for the Baltimore Ravens in 2009. Now, Sean, the father of the couple that took him in, said that the transformation in his family and the transformation in this young man, Michael, started with two words. When they spotted Michael walking along the road that cold November morning in shorts and a t-shirt, I think the movie projects it as the afternoon or evening, it was more in the morning. His wife, Leanne, uttered two words that changed their world. She told Sean, her husband, turn around. They turned the car around. They put Michael into their warm vehicle, and they ultimately adopted him into their family. And I want you to know that those two words, turn around, title of this message, can change your life as well. Turn around. When you make the choice to change your mind and your actions to align with the Word of God. In other words, when you make the choice to turn around and head in a different direction than you're heading now, then you give God permission to come in and work and change your heart. But it starts with us. We move first. And when we move first, and we mean business, you go back to those examples. You walk out of that hospital room with the doctor and you leave there and say, you know what? I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to make the changes I need to make. Or the alcoholic husband, he says, you know what? I'm going to dump the bottle down the drain because it's ruining my life. I'm going to make a change. You can leave this place today literally the first step to a changed heart by simply deciding to change the way you think and following it up with action. Talking about it's one thing. It's easy to talk, man. It's hard to live this out. It's hard to do it. And Satan's, as soon as you decide to change, Satan's going to come in and he's going to throw everything at you to get you to go back. But that's where you stand firm and remember, just like I said earlier, you keep your eyes on him. Not on this, not on the problems. You keep your eyes on him. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for this word today. It's such a basic truth of being your follower. It's a basic life truth, God. And so, Father, I pray today that, as David prayed, that you would search our hearts. And, God, that you would reveal any wicked way within us. God, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I'm just believing that you're moving throughout this place today. And, and each and every person, they're in a different stage of life. They're going through different things. We all have different things we need to repent of. And so, God, I just pray, Lord, right now that you would bring to the memory of each person that you would speak to them on something that they need to repent of today. And then when they walk out of here, not only will it be lip service, but they would say, they would say, I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to follow it with action. Those of you that are in here, if you're in here today with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I just, whatever God's speaking to you right now, I just want you to say, you can just say it under your breath, but God, I repent of whatever it is. God, I repent of Whatever it is, God, I thank you right now for the work that you're doing in the hearts of your people. 
And I pray, Lord, that this message would not be forgotten when we leave, but it would come back to our memory all week, and the truth from your word would change us to become more like you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. I'm going to have you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.